Okay, this is hour four, and uh, we're going to talk about defining discipleship. First of all, the importance of discipleship. Discipleship is God's strategy. I mean, this is not something that uh, someone came up with. This is God's strategy, right? In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, which we call the Great Commission. And the scripture says, Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Therefore, go ye and teach all nations, uh, teaching, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you unto the end of the world, or unto the end of the age. So we know that the expectation is that this discipling program would go till the end of the age. And, and that's how God set things up. Now, I think the church, in a large way, has kind of abandoned what God has really told us to do. And, and uh, uh, the reason I say that is because we think of uh, the church as being a program. Now, when I say we, I'm just kind of talking about the wide general thoughts. I'm not talking about what we're supposed to mean. But the impression is out there that we should go out and we should plant churches, and, which, is a, which is a good thing, but the Bible doesn't tell us to plant churches. It tells us to make disciples. Now, there's a difference because if we go out to start churches, and that's what we have in mind, then we go out and we try to organize something, and then after we get it organized, we try to put it into a building, and after we get into the building, we try to fill up the building. And we ask people to come to the church to hear the gospel. And so pretty soon we have a whole bunch of people in a building we call a church. And none of them are disciples. So we keep uh, doing this and... And that's not what God told us to do. He told us to go out and make disciples. And he said, I will build my church. It's kind of like a farmer. You go out to a farmer and you say, hi, what are you planting? I'm planting salad. What do you mean you're planting salad? Well, that's, we, we need salad. I'm planting salad. So, no, you're not planting salad. You might be planting lettuce <coughs> or cucumbers or beets. So you produce the ingredients for the salad, but the chef makes the salad. Okay, it's the same thing. We don't plant churches. We make disciples. And when we have disciples that come together, God makes churches. Get it? We don't plant churches. We plant disciples. And then the chef, Jesus, makes the salad. So... He said, you make disciples, I will build my church. Okay, now that has to be, <clears throat> excuse me, that has to be an understanding that we have. So he said, all power is given unto me, go ye therefore, and someone even pointed this out to me just a few minutes ago, go in that context is kind of, the tense is as you are going. Okay, so in other words, wherever you go, teach, make disciples. Uh, a disciple is a learner. A disciple is one who is being taught. So there are various levels of discipleship in the New Testament, which we'll talk about in a few moments. Baptize them. Identity, identify with Jesus. Separate from the world. Today... Very often, you can go to churches that don't even mention baptism. You can go to churches that don't baptize at all. 
You can go to churches that think baptism is for some other guy, it's not for them. Uh, but baptism is a definite demarcation between the world society and the church. And he said, so all power is given unto me, all authority, therefore you go, you teach, you make disciples, you baptize them, and teach them to observe. Now, observe doesn't mean to look at. Observe means to keep, to practice. So teach them to observe what? All that I have commanded you. So if I'm going to, uh, good, you came back. I'm glad. I didn't think you could stay away. <laughs> okay. He, he told them to, to teach them to do everything that he had commanded them to do. Well, the last thing he had commanded them to do was go into all the world, teach, make disciples. This is, a, this is an ongoing, perpetuating thing. And so, uh, if we're really in God's program, that's where we're at. The conclusion, every disciple becomes a disciple maker. The, the, the Apostle Paul told that to Timothy. He said, Timothy, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Okay. Now, sometimes we spend a lot of time. I remember a man going to Mexico, and he came back a year later really discouraged because he went down there and he joined with a group of people who were a church in Legaspi, in, in Guadalajara, Guadalajara, and he came back really disappointed. And the reason was that he had gone there and he'd found that a lot of people in that little church had become disenchanted and had gone away and become grumblers and they were kind of throwing rocks at the church and he felt like it was his idea to go and fix all that and to bring these people back into the church and, and uh, kind of like a doctor with a hospital for six saints. And <clears throat> so I said, well, how did it go? It didn't go well. In fact, it was so infectious that he began to feel disenfranchised from the church. Why? Well, he had associated himself with unfaithful men. The scripture don't say to do that. You don't spend all your time trying to fix stuff for people who are disobedient to the Lord. He said, the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. There's all kinds of strays out there. And of course, you don't neglect them. But that's not where you concentrate. You concentrate on faithful men who shall be able to reproduce themselves by teaching other faithful men. That's God's strategy. And there may be some right in this room who are unfaithful men. At least that may have been true this morning. By the time you leave this afternoon, then that'll be different. Okay? But the thing is that we're not supposed to be unfaithful men. We're supposed to be faithful men. And that's not a gender term, that's a, a, a generic term. We're supposed to be faithful people. And that's how God judges us. He doesn't care how mighty you are or how powerful you are or how industrious you are. It's not what God's looking at. God's looking at how faithful you are. Does that make sense to you? If you're an employer, it makes sense to you. Who do you want working for you? Goofballs or faithful men? And that's the same with, with the church. Faithful men, saints, faithful men. So every disciple becomes a disciple maker. Compare these two strategies. You know, this... 
may be an eye-opener to some of you, and it might be a ho-hum to some of you, but think about this. Strategy number one, mass evangelism without discipling. This is kind of hero stuff. A professional evangelist, he adds 1,000 people every day. So he's got this mass evangelism program and he preaches every day and every day a thousand people get saved. Pretty neat, huh? He does that every day. Well, how long does it take him to get the job done? Then we go to number two. This is discipling without mass evangelism. And these are disciple makers multiplying once a year. No thousand people a day. Once a year, we multiply ourselves by two. Kenny comes to me, and he, he's all by himself, but he witnesses to me for a year, and I get saved. Then there's two of us. And then, then we, uh, we, together, we fellowship, we instruct each other, we get in the Word together, and we're evangelizing together, and at the end of the year, hey, what? Kenny want a guy, and I want a guy. There's four of us now. And then we fellowship together, and throughout another year, we're fellowshipping, we're witnessing, we're preaching, and guess what? Kenny want another guy. I want another guy. He want another guy, and he want another guy. There's eight of us now. Yeah, but that's so slow. Look, we're into four years, and we got eight people. Okay, I want to show you something. This guy who is winning a thousand people a day will take 19,178 years to win 7 billion people, which is the world's population today, approximately. Okay? Now, that's if he lives long enough. <laughs> and if the world's population doesn't change. Uh, let's abandon that approach. Let's look at this other guy. 34 years to make 8,596,334,592 disciples. 34 years. That's within the span that most of us here are going to be living in. Which is the most effective, adding or multiplying? Okay, you say, I, I don't, I'm not sure about those numbers. Well, that's more than the present world population, but let's check it out. Okay, here we've got 34 years. So year one, we have one guy. Year two, we have two guys. Year three, we have four guys. Year four, we have eight guys. Five, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024. Okay, it goes on like that. So at the end of 17 years, we've got 65,536. Well, man, that first evangelist did that in 65 days. Well, what about the 18th year? 131,000. 262,000, 524,000, 101 million. Well, we're getting there. So after 25 years, we got 16 million people. No big shots, just 16 million disciples. And it goes on. And at the end of 34 years, we have 8,589,934 1,592 people. After 10 years, this is pretty discouraging. We've only got 512 people. This guy's got 3 million people already. 3,650,000. At the end of 24 years, he's still ahead of us. 
we only have eight million, he has nine million. But at the end of 25 years, he still only got nine million. We got 16 million. At the end of 34 years, he still has 19,000 years to go to catch up to us. Okay. Okay, now, we have to understand that the Lord's program, now that's idealistic, I understand that. That's idealistic. But the principle is what God has established in his church. At the end of all that time, when those eight billion people have been done, I've only made 34 disciples. So, when you look at all of this thing, saints, the strategy of God is faithful men multiplying themselves, reproducing faithful men. Does that make sense? No. Disciple means learner or follower. This can include those who followed for a while without conviction or cost. That is disciples in name only. I hope there's none of them here, but they followed Jesus for the wrong motive. John 6, 26, they followed him for the goodies. And they were called disciples, but they turned back. In John 6, 66, it says many of his disciples turned back. You know when they turned back? They turned back when he said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. So he's talking about unless we become partakers of his life, then we're not really a part of him. Disciple in name only, but then there are disciples indeed. Now look at John 8:31. John 8, 31 says, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. So God doesn't have any disciples indeed that don't continue in his word. This is how important the word is, saints, and we recognize that. Believing to obedience. John 14, 21, 23 and 24 talks about us Believing to obedience. Those who love me keep my commandments. And it says those who don't keep my commandments don't love me. So sometimes we say, oh, so-and-so really loves the Lord, but I know he, he lives a horrible life and he doesn't read the Bible, but I know he loves the Lord. No, he doesn't. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So we recognize that we don't want to fall into the snare of modern-day diluted Christianity that holds no deep regard for the Word of God and doesn't continue in God's commandments. So, I don't think that sloth in the matter of fellowship with the Lord is a good thing. Here's those three verses I just mentioned in John. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. <laughs> oh, that's what I want. I want to see him. I want him to manifest himself to me. Well, verse 23. If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. What a marvelous thing. And then, verse 24. Oh, this is a downer. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. So when we read the Word and see what Jesus said, we have to remember that this isn't just Jesus saying it, it's the Father saying it. So we have that. Disciples indeed. Here's Jesus' definition. One that continues in his Word. 
John 8, 31 to 32. Then said Jesus to those Jews that believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now notice again, the truth won't set you free, the truth will make you free. And so when we, when we, look, at, when we look at this, make is a process, making you free. Remember where we started with Lazarus and the grave clothes. What does continue mean? It means to remain. You continue in my word, you remain in my word, you dwell in my word, you tarry in my word. And here's an illustration. This is Mark 4, 10 through 12. When he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him a parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. Isn't that a little strange? What's wrong with that verse? Seems like he wants them to be converted. Yeah, it seems like he didn't want them to be converted. What do you think about that? Didn't he want them to be converted? Not where they were at. No. So, if you read that verse, if you read that little parable, this follows the sower and the seed. The sower went forth to sow, and then at the end, it says, at, at the end of that explanation, there were these four categories of people. He sowed the seed on the sidewalk, and the birds came and ate it. And he sowed the seed on rocky ground, and it sprung up all of a sudden, but it didn't bear any fruit. It withered away as soon as the sun came out, and uh, no fruit. And then he sowed on thorny ground, and the thorns came up, and they choked it out. No fruit. They all looked kind of good at the start, but they didn't produce anything. And then he sowed on good ground, and the good ground produced some 30-fold some 60, some 100. That's a little fruit, a bunch of fruit, a lot of fruit. But that was the only one that bore fruit. Okay, so in this crowd, in this crowd there were a whole bunch of people and some of them were scribes and Pharisees. And as soon as it was over, those guys took off. But there were a few people in that crowd that it says when he was alone, that doesn't mean he was totally all by himself. He was alone with his disciples and a few people around him. But why were they around him? Because they wanted him to explain the parable. So he said to them, unto you, It's given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to them that are without, it's hidden from them. That's why he spoke in parables. He didn't speak in parables so that everybody would understand him. He spoke in parables so that nobody would understand him except those who came and asked him to explain. Okay, now, this is the same with us, saints. We can go to church, we can listen to the preaching, we can read the Bible, and we can do all this stuff and then go on our way. Or we can continue in his word and we can find out from him what he's really saying to us. And that's why Paul said about the Ephesians, he prayed that they would have a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So, If you're going to really be a disciple indeed, you need to continue in God's Word. You need to find out from God what He's saying to you. Does that sound good to anybody? So, let's be done with this casual Christianity that says, yeah, I'm a Christian because I have a Christian religion. 
We need to become disciples of the Lord Jesus. We need to continue in his word. And if we do, we'll become fruitful. Now, what about this? Somebody said, it sounds like he didn't want them to be saved. Well, did Jesus want every, did he want all those Pharisees to be saved right there? What if they had been? What if all of these people had said, uh, yeah, this really is the Messiah. Let's accept him. Let's, let's put him on the throne. What would have happened? He wouldn't have gone to the cross. So if he had mounted the throne, the kingdom would have come. Well, what's wrong with that? Everybody would have beat all their swords into plowshares and all the wolves and the lambs would lay down together and the kids would play on the snake holes and, and no problem. It would be a wonderful world except for one thing. Death had not been conquered, so everybody in the kingdom would die. And sin had not been dealt with, so everybody who died would go to hell. And so this kingdom would have been just a natural kingdom on earth for a little while. But there would have been no redemption. It was absolutely essential that these people reject their Messiah, take him to the cross, crucify him, and even while he was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So in the cross, he even made forgiveness available to them who crucified him. But he had to go to the cross. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. And that principle is what we've been talking about all morning this morning. Oh, these things are so out of tune with modern Christianity. The gospel never changes. The gospel has always been the same. Okay, they will know the truth. Everything that's not truth is error even though it sounds good. Error is bondage. Psalm 119, 128 says that, I esteem all of thy precepts concerning all things to be right, therefore I hate every false way. Now this is really important, saints, that we start out from there. Some of you young people who have been in a public school system and you've had teachers that teach you evolution and so forth, just as though it were a fact. How many of you have been taught evolution just as though it were a fact? Yeah. Is it a fact? No, it's not a fact. And so the thing is that we have to start out with our feet on the ground. A lot of Christians are standing in this place. They're comparing the truth of God's word to the truth of science. Well, science ain't true. Not what they call science. True science is true. But the fact is that I have to start out, if I'm going to go to a college class, or even now, I guess, even a grade school class, if I'm going to go to that class, I have to be first of all equipped with this frame of mind. I esteem everything that God said about everything is true. That's got to be my starting point. Because you have to have a ruler in order to gauge things. Like if you build a wall, you have a plumb line. So you have something to tell you if your wall's straight or not. If you throw away the plumb line, you look at it and you say, yeah, that looks pretty good. When you get to the rest of the house, nothing fits. Why? Because you didn't have a plumb line. 
And in all of truth, the Word of God is the plumb line. I esteem everything that God said about everything to be true. Yeah, but it doesn't agree with science. I don't care. If it doesn't agree with science, then science better change. God has said the truth. Jesus said, I'm the way and the truth and the life. And so when we go into any circumstance, saints, we have to have a predetermination. What God said is true. What man says is a lie. That's what Paul said. Let God be true and every man a liar. Now, a lot of kids, just think about this. I, in a recent report, George Barna said, how accurate he is, I don't know, but he made a survey and found out that 82% of evangelical Christian youth who go to college wind up as unbelievers. How did that happen? Well, they compared the truth of Scripture to the truth of science and decided that everybody's going this way, so I'm going that way too. So they abandoned the truth. I believe that we have to come to a conclusion, saints, and especially, let me pound this into our young brains, like I guess it's Rush Limbaugh who says, skulls full of mush, okay? Let's understand that everything that God said about everything is true. That's where I start from. Okay, now bring on all of your challenges and all of these things. I don't understand everything, but I know this. What God said is true. And that's where our foundation has to be. And if we will believe that, it says he will make us free. Positive response to God's word frees us from error. The second thing about a true disciple, a disciple indeed, is that he loves the brethren. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. What's this love? What type of love is it? It's as I have loved you. Well now... When did Jesus love me? Yeah, right. It says he loved him before loved us before we loved him. So why do you love Christ? Because he first loved us. That's what it says. Okay, well if I'm going to love like Jesus loved, do I love only those that are lovely, only those who love me? No, he said, even the world does that. Everybody does that. If you love those who love you, what makes you different than anybody else? But when you love those who don't love you, then you're loving like Jesus loved. So it says that we love the brethren. And I know people who say, oh, I don't go to that church because there's a guy over there that... I just hate that guy. I really. I guess you shouldn't be in that church. So that's the, the love of Jesus is unconditional. It's not based on performance or agreement. Demonstrated love. Action, not just feeling. Love to one another, not love for one another. This is not just something that is a response to the good feeling I get. No, this is love to. It's a deliberate love. The third thing is that true disciples bear much fruit. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. So visible evidence of discipleship is not in the works or the words, but in the fruit. Can anybody name the fruit of the Spirit? Okay, this is a team effort, but you're not, you're not saying it very loud, so I don't know if you're all real confident or not. <laughs> okay, let's say it again. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, 
gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. There's fruit, the, the fruit of the Spirit. And, and that's only one of the kinds of fruit. The life of the vine produces the fruit. John 15, 1 through 8. You'll notice I'm not going into all these things, uh, in all these scriptures, because every one of these would be a whole, whole message in itself. But, but we're reviewing these things, and I'm hoping that you'll go home and take these verses and really look at them and see what they say. We're skimming here. But the life of the vine produces the fruit. And it's the Father's life in Jesus and Jesus' life in us. John 5, 57, Jesus said, As the Father is in me, so he that eateth me shall live by me. So it's the Father's life in Jesus and Jesus' life in us. And that's why he said, The Father and I will come and make our abode in you. So it's, it's Jesus' life in us that produces the fruit. It's not just our energy, it's his. And so we recognize that the life of the fruit is in the vine. If I, held, if I drew a picture for you here, and I drew this vine, I drew these roots, and then I drew the stalk, and then I drew the branches, what would you call all that? Would you tell me that, oh, that's a picture of a root and a stalk and branches? Or would you say, oh, that's a picture of a vine? Sounds more like a tree. Well, actually, the Bible says that. He calls it a vine tree. But he's talking about the, the grapevine. And Isaiah, this is a little side note, but Isaiah talks about all the trees of the forest being useful except the vine tree. So he calls the vine a tree. But the fir tree is good for building houses and the cedar tree is good for building furniture and the, and the, the beech tree is great for building cabinet doors. And, and so we got all of these different trees that you can make something out of. But the vine tree is totally useless except for bearing fruit. So you can't chop down the vine tree and build a house with it. The only thing the vine tree is designed for is to bear fruit. And Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Well, the vine includes the branches. So that part of the vine that is me is a branch. And the vine bears its fruit on the branches. And this is the whole picture of the body of Christ, saints. We aren't functioning uh, and independently of the vine. We can't function independently of the Father. We can't function independently of Jesus because the life that brings forth fruit is not the life of the Christian, it's the life of the Christ. Okay? So, it's Christ in me that bears the fruit, it's not me, not you. So this is the reason that it is so important that we really be locked into the Lord Jesus. Okay, I'm kind of going slow here. So there's three types of fruit. The first of all is reproduction. Proverbs says, he that winneth souls is wise. The second is the fruit of the Spirit, which we just went through a moment ago. And the third kind of fruit is edification of the saints, which we read about in Ephesians 4, 16, where every joint supplies and every part works. That's how the church functions. So there's no observers. Some are disqualified. They cannot be called disciples indeed. Who is disqualified? Well, let's look. He that does not put Christ first. Luke 14, 26. 
It says, except you hate your father, your mother, your sister, your brother, and yea, and your own life also. Can't be my disciple. If any man come to me, hate not his father, his mother, wife, children, brethren, sisters, yea, and his own life also, he can't be my disciple. What do you make of that? Are we supposed to hate our dad? Are we supposed to hate our mom? What does hate mean? Love means to love, to make a priority. Hate means to put it in second place, to put it in a lesser place than our first love. So he's not telling everybody to turn around and hate their dad and their mom. He's telling them that, hey, unless all of those things are subordinated to your love for me, you can't be my disciple. Okay, he doesn't bear his cross. Luke 14, 27. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Wow, these are hard stuff. Doesn't forsake all that he has. Luke 14, 33. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he has, he can't be my disciple. Okay, compare denying yourself with forsaking all. Just so that we put all this in perspective. Deny self means preferences of my flesh, my human will. I am denying myself. Forsaking all means my possessions, my ownership. The meaning of forsake is defined in the example of Levi. Now remember who Levi was? What was Levi's job, do you remember? He was a tax collector. What did his name become? Matthew, yeah, he's, the, he's Matthew, the disciple Matthew who wrote the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom, and he said unto him, follow me. And he did this. He left all, rose up, and followed him. Okay, now I want you to note the order here. He left all, he rose up, and he followed Jesus. It does not say he rose up, left all, and followed Jesus. Okay, somebody analyze that for me. What's the difference between those two things? Something took place in his heart, and then he rose up and followed Jesus. Exactly. So we're not talking geography here, are we? If he said he rose up and left all and followed Jesus, you would get the impression that this guy got up off his stool, he just left everything, and he followed Jesus. But that would be a little unrealistic to just do that. So what do we have? We have what the scripture says he did. First of all, he left all. That's a heart condition. Then he rose up and followed Jesus. So he makes another little comparison here. Conclusion, forsaking all is not geographic, it's a condition of the heart. And we can see the example of Lot's wife. Do you remember who Lot's wife was? Who was Lot's wife? Don't say the wife of Lot. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I should ask you, who was Lot? <laughs> yeah, it was. And he went and lived where? in Sodom, and the angels came and said, we're going to destroy Sodom, get out of here. And then they told them one more thing, don't look back. And so they fled. And then it says that Lot's wife did what? She looked back. And what happened to her? That's interesting. She turned into a pillar of what? Salt. Salt. Doesn't say she turned to stone. She turned into a pillar of salt. Okay, so let me ask you this question before we talk about that. 
Why did she look back? That's right. Her heart was still in Sodom, which is understandable because her daughters were still there. Two of them. So we recognize that she looked back because she left something there that was still in her heart. So in her case, she rose up, left all, but it wasn't forsaken. She looked back. And immediately she was salt, but she was useless salt. If you've ever lived in the Orient or somewhere where it's moist and you've got a salt shaker full of salt and you try to shake it out and you don't have a shaker full of salt, you've got a pillar of salt and you can't use it. It's good for nothing. And so that's what happens to the saints when we, our heart is fixed on the world and we're walking with Jesus, but our heart is still in the world, we become salt that is useless. And I believe that that's what God is telling us here, that a disciple, a real disciple, forsakes all and rises up and follows Jesus. Okay. We're talking hard attitudes here. Okay, discussion. Just on that note, as you were saying, I, I couldn't help but be thinking of that verse where Jesus says, put your hand to the plow and look back, you're not worthy, you're not fit. Not fit for the kingdom of God, yeah. That's right. And also, sorry, that other verse just really is on my mind too of um, uh, Hebrews 11 where it says, if they'd been mindful of that country they came out of, they had opportunity to go back. Yeah, right. So in her case, being mindful of where she came out of, that was her sort of like a, a window or a door opportunity to go back. Yeah, amen. That's right. So in her heart, she went back. Right. Any other thoughts? That's right. That's right. Yeah, we need to... Is it, there's nothing academic about our faith. You know, it's the spirit, of, it's the living spirit of God that is in us. I think about one of Billy Graham's own statistics. Uh, this is not a criticism of Billy Graham, but he criticized his own methods by saying that at the end of, I forget what the period was, a year or five years or something, that they could only find 4% of the thousands of people who made decisions for Christ. So out of every thousand people, that means there were about 40 people who were serious. So uh, we, but the thing about discipling is if we're being faithful to the Lord, we don't even really know who all we're discipling. Because there's a lot of people who listen and, and imitate and absorb that you're not even aware are being effect affected. So our faithfulness should not be based on how much visual evidence we see. Although I'm, I'm sure there should be visual evidence, but there's more going on out there than you think there's going on. So, Okay, well, we're going to quit right now. We're not quitting for the day. We're just quitting for 15 minutes. And uh, so when you come back, in fact, I've already used up part of your 15 minutes. <laughs> so we're going to start again at quarter to three.